Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things Meet Carly Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, and today we are coming at you with a new episode covering two brand new records, uh, one of which is Fleet Fox's new release, new surprise release, Shore, and the new Napalm Death album, uh, Joy is an Act of Resistance. <laughs> I <don't> fucking, <laughs> what the fuck is the title? I, I, I of Joy in the... Jaws of, of defeatism. defeatism. Yeah. And Joy is an act of resistance. We, yep, we that's the mention, one. We should mention we are not covering the uh, Knuckle Puck album yes. we said we yeah, were the, because, uh, because we decided yeah. we didn't want to. Yeah. Yeah, but we had better options. Come on. Yeah. So and maybe, maybe anyone was, sure. hanging on, was hanging on that review. Being a yeah. No. And maybe if the album was a better the story would be different. but Maybe if it was an album. Yeah. So anyway, let's jump straight into our our first segment where we discuss what we've been listening to for the past seven days. Jake, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, Well, first of all, I will say uh, I listened to, at your behest, Tyler, today, I listened to uh, Janelle Monae's um, The Electric Lady. Ah. Uh, And I highly enjoyed that I, i'm trying to get back into her um I, I listened to dirty computer uh like sometime early last year and i liked it uh didn't like it as much as most people um but yeah, this record really really clicked with me it has such a wide variety of influences when it comes to genre it has everything from disco to classic rock to pop to r and b to hip hop and it is such a sumptuous combination like every single song has something new to offer for the table and it's so good and i am i am very much looking forward to coming back and re-listening to that because and it, it has is- uh collaborations with prince and miguel that are some of the best songs <sighs> that either of those artists have appeared on oh so- good it's Absolutely. like the it's production so alone like i'm shocked that this seems to be the release of hers that got the least attention i'm just i'm well, flabbergasted it was, like uh the arc android was super like people were nuts for that album when it came yeah out. i haven't listened basically to as good as electric lady but like yeah people were just so in love with that album that it was kind of a high ceiling oh yeah absolutely um i also i i'll i won't even technically count this but uh I've listened, I've listened to the new Deftones a few times. By a few times, I mean six times, and it hasn't been out a full day yet. So, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I, yeah. Um, I yes. went back and re-listened to, to, as a bit of foreshadowing for a later episode we're going to do, I went back and re-listened to Strapping Young Lads Alien, um, which is the fucking heaviest goddamn thing i've ever heard in my life that shit fucks harder than a porn star doing a line of coke i mean like my (laughs) god it it's 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 vicious and it absolutely will will not stop until you are dead Um, not the only time today we are going to talk about strapping young lad yes yes good uh but yeah alien uh just as good as city in my opinion um, in some respects, I can absolutely see why some might even call it better. Um, it's a fucking landmark progressive industrial metal, uh, achievement. Um, I also listened to, um, let's see. I listened to Figure Eight by Elliot Smith, because I am going back and listening to all of Elliot Smith's records. And, uh, Figure Eight is pretty much the most straightforward record he's got that I've listened to. It's a little bit more, um, classic rock-ish than his other stuff. Uh, And I really enjoyed it as a result of that. Uh, He's sort of got an album for any kind of flavor of what you're looking for with him. If you want the more rootsy, acoustic, folky stuff, you go with the self-titled or either or. If you want something that's uh, a bit more lavish, you go with something like XO. If you want something that's a bit more traditional and rocky, you go with figure eight. And uh, you know, it's it's great, because he's great. Um, I'm gonna shout out um 
we, we've alluded to this record in the past a couple of times, but I want to formally shout it out as uh, uh, Spanish Love Songs, Brave Faces Everyone. Yeah, uh, I yeah, did two I'm overnights gonna, this week, and that was one record that I listened that to. that one myself. Yeah, uh, I won't go too into it, so I, I'll, I'll let Tyler speak more to it just because I've mentioned it before. But um, it's one of the best releases this year, uh, one of the best punk rock albums I have heard in a, a mighty long time. If you have, you are a fan of The Hotelier, this is an absolute essential, essential must listen. Please, 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 please get on it. Uh, and last but not least, I will also mention another record that is no doubt going to be uh, talked about by another member of this podcast. And I went back and re-listened to two uh, my, of my favorite records, or my two favorite records from a very important uh, band, Brand New. Uh, one of which is The Devil and God Are Raging Inside Me, which I will allow someone else to talk about because I have a feeling they have a lot of things to say about it. Uh, we, we all had a communal listen of that, Tyler, August, and I, the <laughs> other night. And um, that, uh, sadness was had. Lots, yeah, lots, it's of, amazing. lots of sadness. It's amazing you're still with us, all three yeah, of you. Yeah, I'm, I'm shut like, no. like, like a listening party of the devil and God <laughs> raging inside. Like, that's a joke. That is a fucking joke. Uh, but yeah, that album is um, front to back perfect. I love it just as much as I loved it uh, when I first heard it. One of the first albums that really got me into music. Um, but I also listened to Science Fiction, which is my favorite brand new release. Um, a pulverizing mm -hmm. atomic bomb of an album that withers you until you are nothing but a skeleton and a bunch of bones and uh, I, I love it against my my, my, my favourite brand new release is Deftones Ohms <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Why? Uh, I remember when um, Science Fiction dropped it happened like just after I actually started getting into brand new which is mad yeah right Weird. yeah um and just i was listening to it on a very very long train journey um and my brain was slowly melting just it's unlike anything else i've made and i is all the better for it it's just it's a vision it's submissive from a from a dark outpost in the apocalyptic wasteland right on yeah, I was waiting for that sucker a good three years. That's mm. when I hopped on. And uh, I remember vividly, it came out the same day it was announced. Yep. Because I was, I was at band practice, and I was like, oh, pause everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he texted me when I was working at fucking Walgreens, and he was just like, dude, holy fucking shit, oh my god, oh my god. And I'm like, dude, fucking slow down. Jesus. <laughs> And I didn't. I didn't know such thing. I did no, not slow didn't. down. <laughs> God, that's a record. Well, anyway, you were saying, Jake. No, that's uh, that's all the records that I wanted to, to talk all about. Right. All right, August. Sure. Uh, so I'm gonna immediately pick uh, pick up on that with uh, the first record I listened to being "The Devil and God Are Raging Inside of Me." which is absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm, I guess the best way to sum it up is uh, in my own words, that being, uh, it's an album where on your first listen, you're like, wow, th this is an album about just the most wretched, vile, disgusting person, unforgivable on the world, in the world. And then second listen, it's like, oh, this is about me, isn't it? <laughs> and it just... I'm in this picture and I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> that should be like the... Like they should compile all the brand new albums and the name of the album needs to be I'm in this picture and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, uh, oh it's an equal... It's an album that's in equal measures like both wildly entertaining and wildly depressing. It's such a seamless blend of those two things. I'm absolutely in love with it. I, even though it makes me want to jump off a bridge by the end of it, uh, I, I can't help but go and listen to it. It's, it's fantastic. That's about all I have to say in terms of uh, just kind of going over thoughts. Uh, uh, moving swiftly along, I listened to uh, John Zorn's Spillane, which is an interesting 
conceptual piece of jazz where the idea is to kind of evoke very specific uh, like scenes or moods from a movie and it was all composed on like index cards and the concept is wild but it's also wildly good and i would recommend it. If you like jazz you check it out speaking of jazz africa brass by john coltrane it's very good the title piece africa just insane one of one of the coolest things I've ever heard from Coltrane. And then I listened to Olay Coltrane and I was like, holy shit, this is also amazing. Of the yeah, two get, get used like, to that, uh, get used to yeah. that response from, from Coltrane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I slightly prefer Olay Coltrane to Africa Brass, but I mean, I'd be lying if, <clears throat> yeah, I'd be lying if I, said either were like subpar or even okay They're both fantastic and uh to wrap this up i also listened to uh noise self-titled album a it's just uh one of the most legendary pieces of kraut rock that uh drumming on it is fantastic and literally redefined the way kraut rock was fucking played it's just so good. It's so it's it's just the perfect thing to kick back and listen to. It's yeah. great. I'll I'll take this opportunity as well to shout out Noy's third album, Noy seventy five, which I think mm. it's not as influential, but I think it's even better. It's um a, definitely a go to relaxing album. Like it's got lots of uh, vibrancy, the same level of vibrancy and mm. and forward movement as the self as the first album but it's a little more reflective and beautiful as well so i highly recommend it no i will have to uh, hear that myself do, do i have to have seen the other 74 to understand what's going on no you don't i had the joke was in my head but i was just like no jake they're gonna say that's dumb don't say that <laughs> <laughs> fun facts noi facts noi 75 is named after the year that noi 75 came out 1975 <laughs> no Thank you for following Noi Facts. Fun fact, the band 1975 is named after the year the 1975. Thank you for following. As their the albums 19- are also named after the 1975. Actually, I think that the 1975 comes from like a, I want to say like a, a, an Elliot poem, maybe? Oh, fucking of course it does. Or like some, some poet. Tentious. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> fucking Chaucer, Keats, or fucking Infinite Jest. It's not from like Infinite Jest. They haven't read Infinite Jest. I, I love that that's so you, you, you don't have to have read a book to pull a pretentious quote out of your ass from it. I suppose that's, that's true. That's not in the book. Actually, oh, no, so. no, I know what I was thinking of. I think the 1975 yeah. does come from, it might come from Kerouac, but anyway, what I was thinking sure, of actually is... actually about to say Infinite Jest. <laughs> What I was thinking of is actually the Twilight Sad are named after a line in an Elliot poem. Okay. See, that Anyways. makes sense because, like, tonally. Yeah. Well, like, I'm pretty sure it's, like, just directly to. a line from The Wasteland, which is very fitting. I mostly just wanted to make a joke similar to the Gravity's Rainbow joke in the Knives Out. out. Yeah. About Nobody out. has. Nobody's yeah. fucking read Infinite Jet. That book sucks. It does. <laughs> anyway. Morgan, your uh, turn. Yeah. Um, well, I listened to Deftones Ohms. That goes without saying. More thoughts on that later. <laughs> yeah. Um, I listened to the self-titled Fleet Foxes album. Oh. It was all right. I haven't I mean, heard that one yet. I got I I got no strong impressions listening was- to it. I was just going to say you should have listened. You should listen to Helplessness Blues before we review um, Sure, but then I remembered we're reviewing it now. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Whoops. Um. Yeah, it's it's all right. I didn't. I did not dislike a moment of it, but I I had gotten very little out of it. Um. But th- speaking of things, I have gotten things out of. Segways. Um, listen to 
the replacements album let it be for the first time in a few years and like i mean sweet dear lord god yeah yeah (laughs) i listened to that in preparation for going to the uh dentist's office this week actually wow was the dentist office trip made better yeah this is is a reference to the album Tommy got his tonsils out uh huh anyway (laughs) (laughs) Uh, in preparation for things that may or may not be happening further down the line I re-listened to Portishead's Dummy um, record that earns every single bit of the acclaim and hype it's gotten since its release. We'll get into that later. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe we will. Um, yeah. And I listened in in spirit of the brand new uh, listening experiences of everybody that they've had recently. I went back to their first album, uh, oh. Your Favorite Weapon, which... Um, just I, God, I love it so much. It's real good. I mean, it's it's comfortably, well. No, it is. Say it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, it is comfortably my second least favorite brand new record. Um, but it was something I heard in high school when. Every single overwrought, overly dramatic line written in the album hit home and listening to it again was like going right back to that space, but only remembering the things I enjoyed about being in that space. Mm. So, yeah. It's real it's definitely so on a semester abroad fucking fucks. It's definitely there. Uh, it never goes out. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I believe, 100%. I, I believe I made that comparison in the video. You did. Oh, yep, you might have. That might be why did. I thought of it. Um, but yeah, that actually, that the their first three record arc actually kind of does fit nicely with the hotel yeah. three yep. record arc. To me, anyway. Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. It's yeah, less that's, naked that's... people on the front cover. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are skeletons. That's kind of like being naked. Okay, Phoebe Bridges. That's that's maximum naked. <laughs> that's like super <laughs> naked. That's like hella hot. So that's like that's like Rorschach Jake. naked. Jake, skeletons. That's hella yep. hot. Yep. I like Phoebe Bridges. The fact that I am sexually attracted to skeletons should not be a surprise. Do you want to bone the skeleton? <laughs> That has been it for this episode of the Jam to Tea Podcast. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Next week we're going to be reviewing Sufjan Stevens and Dick Codes. Anyway. And we're also reviewing uh, the Alan Parsons Project, the Dick Up My Ass. Rock over London. Rock on. Chicago. The Sufjan Stevens Project, the Dick Up My Ass. Wow. Cause, homophobia because he get it what because <laughs> he's gay <laughs> this is the worst episode we've ever done sir sir what have you been listening to thank you <laughs> Sorry. Ah! my first record i listened to this week well not my first but one of them was um a promise by shushu oh oh that just sucked the Which, air out of my lungs. The record does that. Um, Again, homophobic. Very... <laughs> I don't It made about as much sense the first time. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's really good. Um, and it has like a standout cover of Fast Car by Tracy Chapman. Um, which isn't as good as the original, but it's a very... Uh, Mm, emotionally faithful, I think, rendition that doesn't choo choo's own artistic uh, <laughs> through line. And it, it's good. I like it. Yeah. Uh, Worth adding at this point that Choo Choo are probably like the greatest covers band working today. 
Like, yes, they've done yes. so many covers of like such a wide range of artists, and they always like um, do a really great job of it. Shout out to their cover of Rihanna's "Only Girl in the World," which is just one of the best covers of all time. Yeah, I mean, like uh, the last time we talked about Shushu on the podcast was um, "Play Some Music" of Twin Peaks, which yeah, just insanely good record. Um, oh, and also shout out to their cover of. Um, under Pressure by David Bowie. By David Bowie. Uh, featuring Michael Jr. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we talked about um, Porter's Head earlier. They do an amazing cover of SOS on High Rise soundtrack, um, which is a great film everyone should watch. Uh, it was one of those points. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'll shut up. Every, everyone should watch it because they would either love it or hate it, but it's still an experience worth having, I think. Anyway, Helplessness Blues. I also listened to that. My opinion is very similar to, to Shaw, which is I like it when the man makes the pretty noises. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that is Fleet Foxes. The man do make yeah, the pretty noise. Exactly. Uh, what else did I listened to this week? Strapping Young Lad, City. Hot, hot damn. What, what a fucking record. Sweet Jesus. Ugh. Um, yeah. Just really, really heavy, brutal. Uh, there's a again a cover on it that's a standout track for me. Um, just a super interesting rendition of a song that combines so many different sounds. Um, what else have I listened to? At the drive-in relationship. The cover was Command. Room Four Twenty Nine. For those of you who didn't know. True. Uh, relationship of Command at the drive-in. It's so fucking good. Ah. Yeah. Yes, yes it is. Yep. Oh god, how have I not heard this singer? Just it's so much all of the things I like on one record. Um, cocaine. <laughs> Sorry. Um demonetized. <laughs> I've also been continuing my binge of the albums of the Mountain Goats with Heretic Pride, which I own on vinyl. It's one of my favorite Mountain Goats records. It's so good. It features their song with the most electric guitars. And it's a, it's a song about feeling like H.P. Lovecraft. And it's so fucking good. And it rocks really hard. <laughs> it's a great song. Feeling like H.P. Lovecraft, dead and racist? Just more like completely alienated by society and hating everyone. Okay. Yeah, and it, it draws that line to the imagining swamp monsters coming out of the ocean. Um, it's interesting. Yes, I, also listened, it does. Yeah. I also listened to The Life of the World to Come by the Mountain Goats, which is interesting because it's kind of mid, but it has some standout tracks. Um, every song is named after a Bible verse. Um, and Ryan Johnson directed a concert movie of it that's really good. Oh, yeah. Um, it's oh, much more stripped it. Yeah, much more stripped down renditions. Um, I think better renditions for the most part than what's on the record. Although the instrumentation is often interesting. Um, and in the, the uh, concert film, he flashes up the Bible verses that are referenced by the titles of the song. Um, it's good. It, and it's done in one take. Um, oh. Yeah. Ryan the Goat. Yeah, like, wow, the taste, the ambition, the style, we love to see it. Anyway, um, that's been my week. Listen to the Mountain Goats guy, like, do it. Okay, you've, you've made us. Yeah. That's true. That's true, I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my week was awesome too. Uh, I listened to a lot of records. I re-listened to a lot of records. Uh, I'll just shout out a few. Um, so the big... A big highlight of my week was finally getting around to Spanish love songs, Brave Faces, everyone, uh, at the behest of, of Morgan and by extension, Jake. Um, yeah, this album is really good. It's really, really, really good. Um, it's, it's emotional punk. It's, it's, it's deeply moving. Um, it's... Uh, it, 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 there are some punk bands and or emo bands that could potentially you could lob 
um, the label of being performative at them, but Spanish love songs are the antidote to that. There is a grim undercurrent of frightening reality to all of, um, frighteningly tangible reality to everything on this record. Uh, it's, it's incredibly immediate and hard hitting. Uh, I listened to it once, it finished, and I immediately put it on again to absorb it some more. Um, it's everything that you would want from an emo revival record, um, and it's perfect. Um, I also want to shout out, I listened to it at the behest of um, friend of the podcast, Zach. I listened to uh, Ariel Pink's Dedicated to Bobby Jameson, uh, which is a very good record. Uh, super weird, quirky, um, basically everything you'd want from Ariel Pink. I think that multiple members of this podcast would be super into Ariel Pink, um, generally. Love Pom Pom. Uh, yeah, Pom Pom's great too. Pom Pom's probably still my favorite Ariel Pink record that I've heard. Um, but this is a really nice one too. Um, yeah, super good, super fun. Uh, I also want to shout out, I listened to uh, a John Coltrane record, a late Coltrane record. This one was released posthumously. Uh, it's called Interstellar Space. Uh, it is a concept album uh, about the solar system um, yes. that is actually just two performers on this record, Coltrane himself and Rashid Ali playing drums. So this album is a saxophone drum duet and nothing else. Um, so it is incredibly um, propulsive and intense. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of like really engaging push and pull between these two performers as they kind of um, drag each other to these different kind of rhythmic and, and, and uh, melodic places. Uh, it's not like a super high tier Coltrane release. I do think that there is an inherent limitation in the duet format. Um, but, but at the same time, it's really remarkable and interesting as a concept and it comes together really nicely. And, and it's, it's very short as well. It's like 35 minutes. Um, highly recommend uh, for people deep diving into Coltrane. A very, very interesting release. Um, I... Also, I'll shout out a couple of records that I re-listened to that I really loved. Um, I re-listened to Sun Ra's Languidity, another great jazz record. This is a jazz fusion record from the late 70s. Uh, absolutely remarkable, transfixing. Like if you haven't, you've probably heard of Sun Ra, but if you haven't dived into Sun Ra's incredibly um, celestial and, and transportive uh, brand of jazz then you're you're sorely missing out an incredibly important figure um i re-listened to big stars radio city um big star is a, a were a, a fantastic power pop band who released three sensational records in the 70s um it was radio city is the second of the three and it's um Number one record, their debut probably has like the more more classic songs, um, but Radio City is is the more cons is the more interesting and varied record. Uh, it really has a lot of just fantastically gritty um, power pop songs on it, um, including September Girls, which is just one of my favorite songs of all time. Um, and another re-listen I'll shout out is that I re-listen to Prince's Dirty Mind, uh, which is just filthy, uh, in all the best ways. I actually underrated this. I used to think that it was lower tier Prince, um, but no, there's just super, so many super great songs on it and it's, it's very, very good. And, um, yeah, if, if you're looking for an entry point to Prince, but the longer run times of records like 1999 and Purple Rain and Sign of the Times, if they put you off, Dirty Mind is like a lean, it's less than 30 minutes long. Um, and it's just really strong for like the whole runtime. It's a perfect way to get into Prince, I think. Um, yeah, and it's basically my week. Yo. Yes. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's move on to our uh, reviews for today. So the first of our new release reviews is uh, Fleet Foxes. Um, their surprise release, Sure, which dropped uh, out of the blue on Tuesday, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did drop um, intentionally at a weird time to coincide, I believe, with the autumn equinox. Um, oh. 
Because it's a very <laughs> Fleet Foxes thing to do. I was about to say that is just about the most Fleet Foxes thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. And, and sure yeah. is an incredibly uh, autumnal record in a lot of ways. It's clear why they wanted to drop it when they did. Um, yeah. So I have thoughts, um, but I'm, maybe I should save them. We'll just um, go through, go in our normal order, shall we? Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, um, I like Fleet Foxes quite a bit. I got into them like uh, a lot of people did with their record, Helplessness Blues, very acclaimed record. People like that one a lot. And uh, yeah, I like that record a whole lot. I listened to that not too long ago again. And I was like, wow, this is like some of my favorite neo-folk that's been made in a good while. And their follow-up, Crack Up, I think Tyler will assist me. Uh, and saying that it is deeply underrated and quite good and almost as good, uh, if not as good, as Helplessness Blues is. Yeah, it's a um, record that gets uh, overlooked, I think, because it's a little denser <laughs> and darker and mm-hmm. a little bit less friendly. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's a very good album. In a way, too, I feel like Shore is sort of a, a mirror to, to crack up in, in a lot of ways. Um, they sort of specialize in a very sweeping, very atmospheric t- style of neo-folk that's just very, um, it's very enrapturing, I think. Um, and that said, it's also like, it's sort of the like, you will immediately know whether or not this is your bag upon listening to like the first couple of tracks of pretty much any of their albums. Uh, and uh, with Shore, I think they take an, an interesting direction. Shore is a notably, like, brighter album. It is a... It, you said it was an autumnal record, and I do kind of agree with you, but it also does give me a lot of summer vibes, a lot of oceanic vibes, and... Yeah. <laughs> uh, you might, you there is oceanic vibes from this record. Yeah, I know, right? With the fucking... The title and the constant <laughs> references, the water... Um, but I think they do a lot with the variation, <laughs> with the variation uh, of their sound. Um, it's definitely, uh, it definitely stands out from their other stuff, um, maybe even more than Crack Up did. Um, I think the record has a, a like elite start to it. I think the front half of the album is excellent. I think it starts off really, really well with the sort of interlude track. Uh, Waiting in Waste High Water, which uh, has sort of a a new vocal presence come to it that adds a little bit. And then we go into Sunblind, which is just a really, really enrapturing, very pretty song. And then you go into Can I Believe You, which is maybe my favorite song on the album, which is a very um, introspective song about trust, specifically in a relationship. Uh, And that's sort of what Fleet Foxes are known for. They're sort of like tying in the world and and nature to that of like a personal internal feeling and there's a lot of more contemplative moments uh on this album that sort of you know that dwell inward as far as it does outward um i think the record stumbles slightly in its sort of like C side, not that I would call any of the songs here actively bad because they're not. I think the record is immaculately produced. I think that Josh Tillman's drumming on this album is positive. Oh, oh. yeah, I'm pretty sure he doesn't drum for them anymore. It's not? Yeah, he's, oh. I, I don't he think left, he has since like the first album. Well, he left here's after the, thing. the second album, I believe. Here's the thing then whoever they got to replace him is probably better. Because I think the drumming on this album is exceptionally good. Like, really, really stand out um, across the whole record. But That's I a do trend think, today. Yeah, that is, that is a trend today. Um, I think that after Young Man's Game, we start with I'm Not My Season through uh, Thymia, Thymia. I don't know how to pronounce that shit. Um, it's sort of a lull for me. Um, the songs just sort of run together, which I never really had a problem with on the previous two Fleet Foxes albums that I really liked, which I can understand someone not getting into this music and like 
what Morgan alluded to on the self-titled Fleet Foxes of just sort of it being like, it's, it's good. I don't actively dislike any of it. It's just, I feel there are more definitive sonic ideas on the front half of the album that, uh, that just work and are a little bit more fully formed and substantiated. Whereas this is sort of a more atmospheric free flowing kind of thing. But I do think it picks up. I think the final two songs, Cradling Mother, uh, and uh, Shore are, are very, very good. Shore specifically is a pretty good album closer um, of the Fleet Foxes albums I have listened to thus far. I think it is the weakest, not comfortably the weakest, um, but I just think that Crack Up and Helplessness Blues are albums that I would return to far sooner than I would return to this, despite the fact that it does have its own sort of niche carved out for it. Don't think it's a bad release. I think if you're a Fleet Foxes fan, you are going to dig this. Uh, I'm slightly disappointed. I didn't love it maybe as much as those two records, but I can hardly be disappointed too much when I still get a lot of enjoyment out of it. It's just, it's a record that probably needs to be not 54 minutes like if this was like a 45 minute record that would be awesome i would i would really like that if it was just that much shorter a little bit more concise that would really kind of mm. work for me uh that is also a trend that is going to continue for me today mm -hmm. uh but uh it's good not like not like ex it's not like it's, it won't win you over if you're not a Fleet Foxes fan. That is very obvious. Napalm so, Death yeah. Record is like 45 minutes. It's 42 if you take minutes. Take out the bonus tracks, yeah. Uh, it's 42 yeah. Sure. minutes. Sure. The, the fuck do you mean? <laughs> sure, I just listed a fact. <laughs> well, I, sure. well, my point, my point wasn't that my point wasn't that they were similar lengths. My point was that I think they're both too long. Look, we'll get to na we're not to reviewing Napalm yeah. right now. Um, yeah. All right, August. Your uh, turn. Yeah. Uh, shit. Where did my notes go? Uh, okay. I guess my thing, just right off the bat, is. Uh, I don't know. I, I related a lot to what Morgan said about the uh, self-titled in his opening statement in regards to uh, this album, and that I think it's a perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable album, uh, and it sounds exactly how you'd imagine it to sound from everything about this, uh, about uh, the Fleet Foxes I knew, and... Uh, I don't know. I'm just not really, just not really all that into it. I thought a lot of the instrumental palettes conjured up on this thing were quite nice, quite delightful to listen to. There's certainly a, a beauty to this. And I did, as Jake mentioned, think the drumming was rather good. I just don't... I don't know, I didn't really get into it as a whole, and I think a lot of that was like the vocals, lyrics, none of it really clicked with me. I did think the, uh, on my experience was on track one, which I quite loved, I thought like, okay, wow, this is a really nice singer, really nice vocals, and then I realized, oh wait, that's not the, <laughs> that's not the singer. <laughs> that's not the singer. And it, uh, and I guess that pretty accurately reflects my experience with the album because I thought Robin Thicke or whatever his name is thought he was okay. Rob, Robin Picker. <laughs> oh, okay, that's it. Okay, is that? Did you have anything else you wanted to say with? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll throw in that any track where the uh, female singer, I will not attempt to pronounce her name because I would butcher it horribly, I thought the tracks she was doing either lead or backing vocals on were quite nice. Yeah, it, it's just not really my thing. Okay. Sure. That's about all. Sure thing. File under the least surprising music opinion of 2020. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Does not disparage you, August. I just don't think anybody expected you to be like, yeah, man, this fucking Feet Fleet Foxes album. This know. was my I, shit. I was kind of ho- hoping Feet he would. Foxes. I was. I was. I mean, he did say, August, you did say that you appreciated the lushness of the instrumentation and like how yeah, gorgeous it I, sounded. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that that despite that you weren't, um, or that even though you feel that way, you weren't bigger on the album. But no, yeah, uh, yeah I just wasn't a fan of. Yeah, as I said, really, lyrics kind of took me out of the experience. It, yeah. Okay. Not that, a whole that, lot. That, I that is to a say. fear experience. Um, Morgan. Well, it was about time that we brought back the old meme of Morgan doesn't like anything without heavy electric guitars. And Fleet Fox is coming right along to deliver that with style. Um, I, my thoughts uh, my thoughts are very similar to August's. Um, I found none of this outwardly bad um, or even really mediocre, I would say. It's just not something I engage with at all, really. Um, it's, you know, it's all, it's all light and airy and indie rocky and indie folky and i do just want to take a nap and li- or listen to something else mm. i mean it's it's okay yeah it feels a niche i'm glad it fills that niche it is not a niche that i inhabit <laughs> plug okay. your shit in whatever wow sersha can you salvage this i, I guess i don't <laughs> fuck myself <laughs> <laughs> No, I love it when Morgan's reviews are short and to the point, um, because it, I find it amazing that Morgan can say so much with so few words, you know. I mean, I like, like yeah, Morgan's reviews whatever. even better when they're actual reviews. Bro! I mean, do, just, do you want, do, do, uh, um, fuck you, like... <laughs> No, no, like fear enough. It's it's totally fear that you didn't enjoy the vibe of the record. I mean, I, it's like a, a a thorough five five and a half record. I mean, do you want me to just make shit up? <sighs> Whatever. I didn't engage with it. I don't. So, exactly. wedding in waist high water is the opening to this record. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, and then Sunblind is the second track. Sorry. Um, this is I. I like this record. Um, I'm glad that, by and large, we, we are moving past the the stigma of it's mid, although some people here probably think that. Um, I'm glad that now I'm just seeing a lot of records I listen to at the moment. You know, it was pretty good. And if we, if we can hold that line, then I, I will be happy. Um, I'm glad we have some records that are probably going to be great coming out soon. Um, but this record was pretty good. Um, I I think the problem with it, though, is that there are only sporadically tracks that really stand out on the track list. Um, it's not exactly like in the sanctum of indie folk records, the most consistently outstanding. Um, because mostly it's just very competent, nice sounding music. And you know, as I talked about on the American Head review, I will listen to that. Um, but you know, when you have tracks on this record that um, I enjoy as much as something like a uh, Young Man's Game, or it's not my season, kind of want the rest of the record to be that level of good. Um, that being said, those are two excellent tracks. Young Man's Game is probably the catchiest song on the record. The hook is sticky and uh, drenched in reverb in a way I really enjoyed. Not drenched. I like drizzle of reverb, but I really enjoyed. Um, and I'm Not My Season, kind of thematically representative of the record. I feel like we haven't touched on the themes of the record as much, but it's gen- it, it's very about now. Um, I'm Not My Season specifically. It's a song about not being defined by the traumatic era you have to live through. Um, which is honestly, if you wanted to write a thesis statement for the whole record, it's that. Um, but I feel like that comes through most pointedly and most poignantly on um, I'm Not My Season, sorry is the name of it. Um, I thought the, uh, the second to last song, 
cradling mother, cradling woman had a bit like Mm, uh, Michigan to Illinois era Sufjan energy to it. Um, it's got that shuffling piano jazzy vibe to it. Yeah. Um, that I made specific note on several times on the Sufjan episode that you should all definitely watch. Yes. Um, Do it. Yes. It's good. Uh, <laughs> it. Uh, I found the mixing strange, but in a way, I liked on that record. Um, again, most of my notes here are just the instruments are really pretty. Um, like for You're a week really or two. Pretty. Thank you. So are you, motherfucker. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, for motherfucker. A week... But sorry. Anyway, uh, for a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> Can you make that noise again? No. <laughs> um... <laughs> anyway, for, for a week or two, my note was beautiful piano, and then going to the sun run. My only note is beautiful guitars. Um, like I don't know. Uh, I also thought M- M- Main Stranza was very good. Um, I also enjoyed Sunblind and Featherweight, specifically Sunblind. It's a bit of a love song. It's a bit of a drive through the American country song. If you want a song that pairs uh, feelings of romantic affection with uh, feelings evoked by the beauty of the American countryside, represented both lyrically and tonally in the music, Sunblind is the song for you. Although there are other bands that probably do it better, um, but it's still, yeah, you know, I thought it was very good. Um, yeah, Featherweight again, sort of thematically on point for the record. It's a song about pushing through hard times um, and getting uh, the one long, last long year be forgiven, all that war that lasted within it specifically uh, evokes that feeling of just let's get this year over and done with and move past it, which is an idea that I, you know, outside of the context of a pretty song about the idea, have issues with. Um, I don't want to pretend like the problems that have come up in this year aren't going to continue into next year unless we do something about it. Um, But it's a very nice song evoking a very hopeful ideal. And I think that is worth something. Um, So yeah, overall, I like this record. I'm... Uh, I thought it, it's lyrically pretty, like the poetry of it is just nice to listen to. If it's not always the most deep record or the most groundbreaking record, it is pretty. Well, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do think that there's a lot of um, depth to this record, to be honest. And I want to give it some credit because uh, it's worth mentioning as well. Like we did allude to the fact that this was only released on Tuesday. Mm. normally uh, we review releases when they have had a little bit more time to exist um, than this has. Uh, So, and I do feel like this is a record that um, you kind of do need to sit with for a bit. I know I certainly did. Like, I don't really think I fully got it until like last night, to be honest. And I've listened to it every day since it came out, Um, sometimes multiple times. And yeah, (sighs) Fleet Foxes are always can be, can always be relied upon to bring about lush instrumentation uh, and a gorgeous sound, but I think that it's not often kind of appreciated or highlighted like exactly what's going into it that makes it so lush and makes it so gorgeous and impressive. Uh, and there's a lot of instrumental density and diversity on this record. Like it's not just you know let's layer our acoustic guitars ten times just so it sounds big and cool. Like there's horns on this record, there's piano on this record, there's a really kind of quirkier kind of um, uh, percussive instrumentation as well as um, brass instrumentation as well that kind of dots across this thing. Um, And yeah, and there's a lot of um, density in terms of what Pecknold's writing about and and the ideas that he's discussing. It's not as dense uh, in terms of subject matter and sound as Crack Up was in many ways it feels like uh, a return to a slightly earlier sound than that record so the one this has the most uh, sonic kinship with to me uh, is is helplessness blues it kind of has the spirit it's closest in spirit to their debut but there's a lot more maturity uh, in the writing here than there was in the debut so it feels like a, a leaps and bounds uh, a move forward from that because uh, their because their debut and the early stuff was very kind of fantastical, and then there was a lot of sort of um, almost like fairy tale and storytelling elements to it that made it feel very kind of 
um, for lack of a better word, eerie fairy. Um, you really kind of have to be into that to dig that. Whereas they've kind kind of consciously tried to move away from that and then more into the realm of the real and like the physical and like reality um, with the last two records, especially. Um, so yeah, this feels like the most present um, Fleet Foxes album in terms of reflecting the real world and and real emotions without dressing them up too much and and kind of literary illusions and 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 weird uh, poetry like like Crack Up did. Um, but I kind of want to lead off uh, my my dissection here by talking about the fact that we've had a lot of timely music this year. Um, w- music that whether intentionally or not captures the heightened feeling of apocalyptic doom that's hung gracelessly over 2020. Proto martyr type beat. Yeah, and and that, that, that kind of heightened feeling of apocalyptic doom has cast a pall on all of the art that's come out this year, and sometimes unfairly so. Sure, to me, is like an antidote to all of that. Uh, it's an album that, whether intentionally or not, it serves as a kind of beautiful and rich escapism, a vision of brighter things, a reminder of the natural beauty all around us, a thing that the band have always tapped into with ease, but here feels especially affirming, uh, and, it's, and that's especially so after the relative darkness of their troubling and dense last record. That said, I do want to impress the fact that I don't think it's a dull or a mindless escapism either. Uh, there's a consciousness of the of the weight of what is going on that that does kind of hang over this and does kind of come to the fore in certain songs. Um, there's a rich tapestry of emotion across this album, I think, and, and it's clear why uh, frontman Robin Pecknold made the really on-brand decision to release it at the exact time, down to the minute, of the Northern Hemisphere's autumn equinox. This is a record that captures that long transition from summer to winter, where there's an awareness of the darkness to come, but still the remains of summer's glow. Uh, Autumn is a time of gradual decay, uh, and yet that decay is always beautiful. uh, And I think Shaw captures that perfectly. Um, It opens with the beautifully pristine welcoming of wading in waist high water which flows into early standout sunblind and, and sunblind i think is like the platonic ideal of a fleet foxes song uh it's a beautifully uplifting ode to artists that have inspired picknold but have since passed away with john prine elliot smith david berman curtis mayfield and marvin gay among many others uh, mentioned by name in this song uh, the even more uplifting Can I Believe You is another standout and I think quite comfortably joins the canon of Fleet Fox's greatest songs. Uh, with, the, with choral vocals, contribu- this is a really interesting detail, the, the choral vocals on this track were contributed from afar by hundreds of Instagram followers of the band who recorded them in their own bedrooms oh, and sent awesome. them. Uh, and and then they mixed them so they didn't sound like home demos, and and that was really awesome. So those kind of hundreds and hundreds of different voices contributing to the choral the choral vocals on this track. And what they the purpose of that is they serve as a bedrock where you have Picknold's doubt and his slow learning to trust others and allow himself to be vulnerable is displayed lyrically, and that's supported beautifully by this far-flung choir who are kind of like serving as that support to him in his sort of struggle to, to um, get to that place. Um, and, and that, to me, is about as beautiful and moving of a summation of how this year has been and how we can survive it as anything that any artist has done this year. Um, the blooming jara is is lyrically dense, uh, a eulogy for those lost to America's steamrolling of the poor and the forgotten. Uh, and I, I love the incredibly jazzy piano contributions to the song Featherweight, which add a lot of character and swing to an otherwise moodier minor key dirge. The, the soaring vocals and, and steady push of a long way past the past makes it another standout among standouts. And again, you've got this mix that's rich with horns and playful guitars, 
but it's all held together beautifully. I think it's, it's perhaps easy to understate what an achievement uh, the mixing is on this record. Like there's a lot going on and the fact that, um, I mean, if it were poorly mixed, you would all be saying things like, uh, you know, it sounds really cluttered and, and, and there's too much happening, but the resounding consensus has been like, these are really lush arrangements. Um, and that's, I think, a testament to the fact that it's not diff- It's not easy to um, bring all of these um, disparate instrumental elements together and make them kind of sound like one unified whole. Um, but but they do it like consistently across almost every track on this record. And it's such a wonder. And to hear music this straightforward on the surface, but bristling with complex instrumental interplay, is such a wonderful and rare thing from a new release. I think, especially to see as much diversity as you see here without ever losing a core unifying sound or drifting off course. Uh, it's 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 really really great. Uh, the influence of the band Grizzly Bear is apparent across this record. Uh, especially due to the fact that two members of that band, Daniel Rosson and Christopher Beer, uh, regularly contribute to these arrangements. Um, yeah, so this does, in a lot of respects, uh, remind me of of, um, a, of a Grizzly Bear album like Shields, for instance. Uh, one of the most immediate and rich tracks on the record is second half opener, My Stranza. Um, and I want to kind of uh, hopefully serve as a nice wee counterpoint to Jake's comment that he felt the second half of the record was a bit of a comparative um, step backward because I really dig the second half of the record actually quite a lot. It does have maybe a one or two of my least favorite tracks on it, but I what I really love about the second half of the record is it has an almost sweet-like quality with most of the tracks being on the shorter side but still delivering thoughtful builds and resolutions. Um, and, and Sersha, uh, you alluded to the song, um, I've actually forgotten what it's called now, the I'm Not My Season. Uh, and I think that's a, a beautiful example of that. Um, uh, yeah, so, so they, most of the tracks are on the shorter side, but they have these thoughtful builds and resolutions. And they also have sort of, they also serve as internal counterpoints to each other. And I think nowhere is this more clear than the superlative quiet ear slash joya. Uh, which is one of many examples in the band's career of single tracks that are actually multi-part progressive pieces within their folk framework. Um, Quiet Ear is hooky with a constant forward moving thrum and these catchy melodic motifs. And Robin muses on the sense of uncertainty and fear that's hanging over the world. And then the clouds part and in a beautiful progression that I think owes more than a little to late talk talk the song shifts into an even more persistent, anxious call and response between Robin and and himself. Um, And I think that um, for all the relentless optimism of of the sonic palette of a lot of this record and the upbeat brightness, a track like Quiet Ear slash Joya does acknowledge the darkness that's going on. uh, and And it ends up being one of the strongest tracks on the record, I think, for that acknowledgement. And for the emotional um, directness of it. Uh, The record climaxes with the one-two punch of Cradling Mother, Cradling Woman and the title track. Um, The former piece is a five-minute constant swell of gorgeous motion. Uh, The Sufjan comparison, Sersha, that you made, I think is really apt there. Whereas the latter track, the closing track, is this stunning piano-driven finale that eventually kind of collapses into a swirling maelstrom of cymbal hits and repetitive chanted vocals and these thrumming guitar chords. And then finally you get a, a, a final burst of order that emerges from that chaos with the, with the final line of the record, now the quarter moon is out. A line which refers to the time that the album was released and I think ultimately serves indirectly as a summation of the album's ethos, which is that we are here, it's now, and we're alive. There will never be another moment but this one, which spans eternal until eternity ends. Um, and that kind of is a beautiful uh, capping moment on a record that, that explores that idea of, of living in the present and, and, and finding richness and beauty in the world around you, even if it's um, difficult to find that. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's a really strong record for that. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure where I would rank it yet in the Fleet Foxes catalog. I think it's, I actually might even, 
Crack Up is still my favorite, but I might even like this more than, than Helplessness Blues. It's, it's hard for me to say yet because it still is early days, but uh, I, I, I do really admire and respect the, the effort that's gone into crafting this as a holistic piece. Um, and, and I hope that with time, uh, it may grow on some of you or, or it may kind of just generally get a little bit more uh, respect for, for what it's doing. Um, not, and I'm not like talking necessarily about you all, just generally, um, uh, because I think it's super impressive and, and I really enjoy listening to it. And I just put it on and it immediately puts a smile on my face and, and it's, it's beautiful um, music to just walk to and, and be in nature to. Um, and I think that uh, during a year where a lot of us have been kind of stuck inside, it's really nice to have something that transports you like that. Well, yeah, very, very good review, Tyler. Thanks. Enjoyed that a lot. Cool. Uh, does anyone want to add anything or? Uh. We can jump into our favorite tracks. I wonder who Tyler could mean by someone who would want to add a bit more. No, look, I genuinely, I'm not targeting anyone. I'm sorry for being a no, bit know, bitchy I before. I, I, was, uh, I, I just wanted to see if time. anyone wanted to add anything. <laughs> I was joking. Um, but no, I'm good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, let's, do, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings. Yeet. Yep. Okay, who wants to go first? Same order? Do same, same order. order. Okay. My three favorite tracks are Sunblind, Can I Believe You, and probably I will shout out uh, A Long Way Past the Past. I didn't mention that song. I really like that one. Uh, least favorite track, hmm, probably Going to the Sun Road, just one of the least memorable on here. Just it, it, good, but not great. And uh, yeah, give it a seven. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I guess my three favorites would be, uh, Waiting in Waste High Water, uh, Sunblind, and Shore. My least favorite was probably, uh, Can I Believe You? And I don't know, I'd give it like a five out of ten. Okay. Well, uh, Sasha, do you want to go now? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so my favorite tracks were... Young Man's Game, I'm Not My Season, probably Featherweight, and my least favorite track was pro would probably be uh, Jara. I can't remember a fucking thing about that song. And I'm going to give this a seven and a half. Awesome. Oh, okay. Well, we'll wait. For, uh, since Morgan's not back, I will go. Uh, my three favorite tracks are probably, um, I'll say, Sunblind, Can I Believe You, and Quiet Ear slash Joya. Uh, my least favorite track is um, The Interlude for a week or two, I think it's called. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good interlude, but it's ultimately an interlude. Um, yeah, and so I, I give this record a very, very strong 8.5. Nice. We love to see it. Yeah. All right. Morgan. Morgan. All righty. So my three favorite tracks are Can I Believe You, uh, Featherweight, and A Long Way Past the Past. Um, my least favorite is, I don't know. It's, it's in, I'm in such a weird space with this album because I didn't, dislike any of it so picking right. a least favorite track is hard i'd probably go with the uh the interlude the it's a four week or two is that what it's mm -hmm. called yeah that one uh and for rating is, is a strong five and a half cool. okay i'll take it 6.7 out of 10 yeah okay so now we're going to turn to our second new release of the week, uh, perhaps a little less heralded than the string of, of popular new releases that we're talking about this week, next week, and the week after. But uh, this is the new Napalm Death album. 
uh, throws of joy in the jaws of resistance and <laughs> sorry had to um jaws of defeatism and um so i mean i'm sure if you're a music fan you're probably familiar with with napalm death at least as a concept um so they're a uh, grind core industrial metal I'm, I'm not like sure the exact um genre death history. core grind core yeah basically if, if there's it, a core if it in it you- and they've done it. If it makes yeah. you happy, yeah, I discovered right. um, Napalm Death by... Uh, I've mentioned them before, but uh, Pagefire did a video called mm. How to Make Grindcore, and they went yeah. through the history of it, and they were like, you know, they heralded Napalm Death as a real innovator of the genre, although they have uh, yeah. expanded the sound much more since then, I would suggest. Yeah, and of course, their, their debut record, Scum, is is pretty seminal uh, release. Mm. Um, very important um so yeah and so but they've made like i think at least a, a lot of albums in the interim like they're at like least, at least a dozen yeah yeah at least a dozen mm-hmm. uh and so here we are in the year 2020 with this new release um yeah and i'll free reign who wants to kick this off i'll have a go um just because i think um it's important to note that the reason that um, I put this album on the docket in the first place is, it, you know, they had the legacy they have, but their last record was incredibly highly praised by music critics. Um, 2015's Apex Predator, Easy Meat, um, which was a record that succeeded by just doing the kind of nuts and bolts grindcore stuff, but at the peak of aggressiveness with not a not a single song that doesn't feature an incredibly satisfying riff or drum beat or uh breakdown of some kind um and i would say having listened to that record um it's very good i don't think it's great but this record is less than that i think it suffers from being i think kind of inconsistent um and too long and then if you listen to it on Spotify, there are three bonus tracks on it, one of which is inserted before the final track, and it's still labelled a bonus track, which okay. is weird. Well, that's definitely not the version of the album I've listened to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's fine. Well, I, I'm not going to talk about the bonus tracks. So, I, but um, Unfortunately, I, think... I will, because I just discovered I've been listening to the bonus track version, even though the bonus tracks are not labelled bonus tracks. Thanks, Apple Music. Oh, fuck. The label on Spotify, anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, I think there are some real standouts here. Um, I enjoy uh, songs like The Belly Full of Salt and Spleen, Contagion, Immoral. Um, they are doing the punishing riff thing and the screaming thing that they do very well. Um, and when I listened to this album, The Last Time to Make Notes, I read along with the lyrics. And yeah, it, ha- it has the problem that grindcore lyrics have of just being very, um, like, basic and just uh, serving their purpose. Um, but they work. Like, oh, gee, lot- someone's listened to Slayer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, they work in um, you know, as traditional to the genre of grindcore, various uh, political allusions and abstract poetry. Um, some of which ties together just through painting a scene um very disparate ideas related to our modern time in a way that makes sense in a cohesive way and i think that's interesting although if you just listen to the music you are going to get none of that but that's fine to me anyway um i also enjoy the curse of being in thrall um songs like backlash just because i find a bit too vague for their own good even though they are incredibly blatant about what they're trying to say something about um i find they kind of beat around the bush about what they actually think about the matter in specific um but yeah a lot of it is just lacking the immediate punch of their last record um and i'm not surprised this has not been heralded in the same level of quality because although there are some tracks that do innovate their sound, introduce uh, elements of industrial sounds, or even gothic rock on one track, um, different types of grooves, um, a lot of it is just very boilerplate, and there's nothing about what they're doing that um, is sort of grabbing you by the throat 
in the way this music needs to, like their last record did. Although I think it is still worth listening to. It's not a, a quote unquote bad song. Just some songs are much, much better than others. And some songs are much, much more uh, innovative on their sound than others. Word. Morgan, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I like it when, when the, uh, the English man's go burr. <laughs> and that is why I enjoy this album so thoroughly. God, it's just, I mean, ugh. I feel like it's exactly what I needed after, you know, the sort of, to, to, to cap off the section of sort of consistently mid releases of the past few, uh, the past two months or so, roughly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know that and Reanimator pretty much just cut the cut the cord on that, and yeah, it's real. It's just satisfying to listen to. I think it sounds incredible. It's not, you know, polished, but it's not. You know, it doesn't sound like a potato. Um, <laughs> the riffs are incredibly fun to listen to. The drums are propulsive. The whole thing has, you know, all the the sort of violence that you'd expect out of a band called Napalm Death. <laughs> and it's just, it's it, it feels real nice. There's something really cathartic about listening to it that I really, really enjoy. I, I've, I also find the, the record uh, impressively consistent. Uh, again, I have trouble picking... A least favorite track it's just because I, I like all of them to varying degrees um though i will totally co-sign search's sentiment of the uh lyrics are a little too vague to properly get at what they're getting at um particularly on the uh the the, the second track what, what the hell is that backlash just because yeah that one yeah, it's a really general one. Um, like I, I, uh, you know, it just I, of all of the things to care about in 2020, <laughs> I cannot understand caring about cancel culture. Like the people yeah. who who don't get work because they're canceled are because are because they're criminals, and the people who <laughs> are and the people who are canceled and continue to get work that goes as far as twitter so i don't understand why this is a big deal in the first place certainly not right worth writing a song about yeah um that said it's pretty banger so yeah, yeah. yeah. it definitely goes um, it goes, yeah. Yeah. It, goes it goes it goes very very great uh very yeah. very great it's really satisfying um and the beat downs are so good yeah and just yeah but yeah, it's it's clear that this is a group of musicians who have been doing this niche for a long time, and they haven't lost a step anywhere along the way, really. Just yeah, it's um, good. I don't have much to say, so I'll be super quick. Uh, I really love this album. Oh, I really like it a lot. Um, yeah, I, I I will confess, I haven't dug super super into the lyrics, like so. I'm a bit of a hypocrite. You, but you needn't. But yeah. you need not. Uh, I just you're really enjoyed... not going to gain much from your analysis. No, I, like, I, I, I figured not. I did. I just enjoyed the the pummeling nature of it. I felt that it was actually really consistent. Um, again, I did not mm. listen to the bonus tracks, so I can't speak on them. But I felt that it was uh, across the twelve tracks. I really don't think there was any kind of uh, weak point that jumped out in terms of playing. I I really liked uh, when the band got. Uh, again, I should be clear as well. This is the first Napalm Death record I've listened to in full, so I have a lot of uh, context lacking here. But I did think it was awesome. Um, I really dug when the band went in a direction that seemed uh, a little bit strange for them. Uh, I uh, for them, like I would know, but like it seemed like it was uh, stuff that I, I wasn't expecting. Uh, I particularly want to highlight the track Joie de ne pas vivre, which is just spine chillingly dark mm-hmm. and and upsetting. Uh, and I really dug that aspect of it. Like it just sonically, it just felt like being dragged to hell. Uh, whereas the other records were a little bit more immediate and 
frontward and their and their violence. Um, mm-hmm. I also I also really love the song Contagion. I love the vocals on that track. I thought they were really kind of eerie and, and counterpointed nicely to the to the heaviness of the instrumental. It was it was super memorable. I felt I I, I really dug uh, Invigorating Clutch as well, which is exactly what I did to my crotch when I heard the song. <laughs> <laughs> Bad joke. Invigorating. Um, no, but no, Invigorating great track. Oh! Just, <laughs> yeah, that, that was me. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, I dug fluxing of the muscle as well. The way he says muscle, muscle, muscle on the song was like, ah, just really like, you yeah. could feel the, the veins popping. Uh, <laughs> title track I thought was awesome. Uh, and I also want to shout out the closer, a belly full of salt and spleen, which actually, of all things, sounds like nothing else on the record, but of all things reminds me of like No Wave Era Swans. Uh, like specifically yeah. like mm-hmm. public castration, sort of the live versions of the greed, holy money stuff uh, oh. reminded me copy. Yeah, it reminded me of that. Although there was a little bit more happening that like that swans is a little bit more sparse version of that. Whereas this is kind of a little more going on in the mix, but the sound is very no wave uh, on this track, which I thought was an awesome, awesome way to end an album like this, because it's like you weren't, you weren't expecting that from a record that's very much not in that particular niche for most of it. Um, but yeah, super, super fun. I, I, I dig the hell out of it. It's not like a super, you know, intricate or dense album. Uh, I'm sure that once I, once when slash if I look into lyricism, I won't be like blown away. Uh, mm-hmm. I did get the, d- definitely got the vibe that backlash just because was about what it was about. Um, uh, so maybe mm-hmm. I just chose to ignore that while I was listening to it. Um, as you probably should yeah also like fuck the factoids just a superb opening track like you're immediately thrown into it um yeah really 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 good album mm-hmm. to me jake For do you, you? Wanna, jake yeah do you want to go next <laughs> uh sure i i, I anticipated <clears throat> probably being put in I, I or at least i anticipated this being a kind of a hum situation except here I'm going to pull a Morgan in the last segment and just kind of say, there is not a single thing here that I would deem bad or again, average even. That's it's all the, good. That's the pull quote they're going to go with on the press release. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> they, I would deem bad. They probably but, would. <laughs> but, but the, I, I will say, uh, the cir- circumstances surrounding my listens to this mm-hmm. did no favors because this genre specifically, I'm really more into it being blended with other th- things. Like I'm really, I'm a big fan of uh, like Daughters earlier stuff, like that kind of grindcore. When it's not just grindcore, um, that said, this isn't either. But it's a bit more bass and a bit more feral, and I can understand liking that. However, the whole album just it really runs together for me. Like the, the, I'm not sure if it's just maybe I don't click with this genre because this is clearly a, a skilled effort from a story band. Um, even though I shared the complaint about the lyrics being a bit vague, this is still a fairly topical record. You know, they're speaking truth to power. Contagion is pretty, pretty obviously about the coronavirus, I think. I mean, yeah, I don't absolutely. know if that was the intention, but it, it is feels not like actually. Uh, oh, according well, to them, they totally. wrote it, wrote it, recorded it before the uh, pandemic. Interesting. There's a couple lines in there where I was just like, "Oh, is that like a like?" They talked about families being huddled together on top of houses, and I was just like, "Oh, is that like a social distancing yeah, like, thing?" Like, well, no, it's just like the way that it ties together um, the faults of an oppressive government with. Yeah. Uh, illness and contagion ravaging yeah. a society. Yeah, yeah two on the money, and that two makes you know makes a lot of sense. Uh, lyrically speaking, again, not the deepest shit in the world, but again, if, if I said if you like shit like Slayer, where you know half of the lyrical content on a given record is basically them just talking about incredibly brutal ways of comically dismembering people, <laughs> which you know, I'm I'm for it. Um. I also, again, the bonus tracks did not help me here. Like, I, again, just now figured out that they were, in fact, bonus tracks. And for me, the album is 51 minutes, which it already felt a little too long just because, I, I don't know, I, I like the, the short and sweet approach from this kind of stuff and, you know, bordering on the 
on the, on the 40 minute mark, I'm just kind of like, eh, this could have maybe gone down. It is definitely a shot in the arm. It's definitely like satisfying to listen to and it sort of strikes a good balance. It's just that it manages to like hit just well enough on the dartboard for me to be like, yeah, it's good. I, I just don't really have any desire to come back to it again just because I feel that I've gotten what I've wanted to get out of other records this year, perhaps, where this specific emotional catharsis, um, in many ways, this is kind of funny that this and the Fleet Foxes album are, are two picks this week, just because they're like, they have the same goal, just with like completely different ways of, of going about it and in completely mm -hmm. different musical hemispheres. Uh, but I don't know. There's there's something about the fact that the like the vocal deliveries, the hooks, the riffs, I can point them out and just be like, yeah, this is this is good. It's just that none of it really registers with me. It's almost happening so hard and so fast that it just sort of like just right over my head, and I'm just like, I want to be able to to sit and focus and digest this, and I could just never get on its wavelength. And I also have been, you know, I'm listening to a lot of metal albums this week that I like considerable more amount. And that's not the album's fault. But when I've been, you know, shooting ohms into my fucking eyeballs, listening to this, again, sounds like primitive. It's <laughs> like, I get that that's the appeal, but I also am just like, eh, this is a double-edged sword for me. So I don't not enjoy it. If you made me go back to it, I wouldn't say or complain much, but I, I had a good time with it. But a good time was pretty much all I had with it. So. If I if I could uh, piggyback off some of that to add an addendum to what I said earlier, um, if that's right with all of you. No, not uh, allowed. I deemed away. Okay. Well, well Dind, you're dumb. I feel yes. like I focused maybe too much on some of the negatives of what I felt um, because honestly, when I say the record's inconsistent, I don't mean very. Um, loads of these songs are amazing, um, and it's just I think because. It's maybe a bit longer than what I want from a record of this genre. Um, I maybe want, I think maybe just, there are points where I get a bit just exhausted and that's a me problem more yeah. than anything else. I, I have the same issue. Um, uh, and it just means it is harder for me to take in what's going on. So it does sound a bit more um, like each other. Um, I will highlight again, Belly full of salt and spleen is what I was partially what I was alluding to. I will also include Joy de ne pas uh, vivre in this, uh, where they are really experimenting with sounds that I haven't heard from them before. Um, so, so one uh, belly full of salt and spleen closer. One of the ugliest tracks on the record. Um, you mentioned Slayer being about various ways to dismember someone. Um, yep. A belly full of salt and spleen is very explicitly about feeling judged and then wanting to drown the person who is judging you. Um, relatable frankly yeah totally uh and that's that's just the narrative of the record of the song um and it's simultaneously like you you go with it and then you're questioning yourself for going with it and it's just this really strange and dark kind of narrative and the music is super super creepy um, and yeah, interrogating clutch, amazing song. Uh, the riffs and the, the, the feedback coming in is so threatening, and the hook's really catchy. It's probably the catchiest hook on the record in a riff. Um, but yeah, uh, and you know, it wasn't so much a fan of Zero Gravitas Chamber, or, but uh, uh, the, the, I will co sign the fact that many of the riffs are just super catchy, fun, and punishing, and dark and groovy. I'm not groovy. There are a couple of songs that are groovy, but not many. Um, and I just wish to basically roll back some of the negatives because I feel like I overemphasize that because I do really like the record, but I don't like it as much as their last one. That's fair. Or we haven't heard from August yet. Yeah. Okay. So uh, right off the bat, to speak a bit to Jake's experience, the first time I listened to this album, it was with... Uh, said bonus tracks and i do think all three of them are comfortably worse than anything on the actual album and i fully understand the perspective of those making the record feel in particular very bloated and a bit long-winded especially towards that last uh 
last quarter of it. Uh, but that being said, I caught that error by my second listen, and I was able to experience the record in the way that it was most definitely intended, and I think it is a phenomenally better album in that respect, because, uh, yeah, there's, it's just completely catchy as hell. It's got a great amount of energy. It's heavy as hell. It kicks your ass to Saturn and back without any fucking hoopla about like shifting into states of depression or whatever the fuck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't it doesn't take itself too seriously. Chiefly of all, I found this record had a consistently great sense of humor, despite how dark it was. Like the. Uh, the track with the French title, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It translates into English as the joy of not living, which is the funniest thing I've heard. And I think so that real... It's so stupid. It's, it's so dumb. <laughs> like it's, it's, but... clearly, it's clearly like a reference to the, the saying, like joie de vivre. Like yeah, no, life. most, but, most but definitely. It's amusing. To, it's an amusing little subversion of that. It's an amu- it's a dumb subversion, but I feel that's kind of how you have to have to meet the record. That it's just it's it's not really taking itself seriously. It's just trying to have fun. I mean, the sheer speed and skill. Yeah, I will say second. I will say just to balance that, the title of the record is very like I don't know portentous and and grand. Uh, in a way that I think maybe undercuts the silliness that, that it has at some points, uh, but that's a minor criticism. Uh, I mean, I I would kind of take that in the opposite direction. I think the long, wordy, stupid title is kind of <laughs> kind of mock, kind of playing around with that that you expect somehow overwrought, overblown thing, and it's just these quick, speedy technical performances that are just frankly mind-boggling for people who are in their like 50s at this point i'd have to assume because yeah yeah, yeah. um i don't know their ages but every member of the band is not a founding member so they no yeah that's yeah. that's exact that's another interesting point that the band has done a complete ship of thesis type deal where they every original member is gone with new people in it now uh yeah, that. But that aside, uh, it's just very entertaining. I find, uh, yeah, the lyrics don't really contribute all that much, and you're perfectly fine without really paying too much attention to them. But I do think, so long as you can just hear the uh, anthemic shouting of the song's title, it's it's fun enough. I mean, yeah, it's everything's been said about it. It's great, and I'm very astonished that they do not have more attention towards them for being a band who has been so consistently good for nearly like 30 years now. Yeah, I, I think all that is all that is is just the extremity of the genre and perceptions about that. Um, yeah, yeah, like you, you tell someone, I've got this great grindcore band you should listen to. They're not, they're not going to do that. But people yes. in the music world do know who Napalm Death is. Like They're basically yeah, a absolutely. ubiquitous name. It's just that fewer people, considerably fewer people, actually listen to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Good reviews, everyone. Um, let's go into our favorite tracks and ratings. Uh, we went Jams and Tea previously. Shall we go reverse Jams and Tea this time around? No, yeah. Why not? Let's do it. So... My three favorite tracks on this record are Contagion, Joie de ne pas vivre, and The Belly Full of Salt and Spleen. My least favorite track is, if I had to pick one, I would maybe pick uh, Acting in Gouged Faith, maybe, just because I don't really remember that one too well. Um, And I will give this album a very strong uh 7.5 bordering on an eight that is very very fair um i am going to say my favorite tracks are contagion invigorating clutch and a belly full of salt and spleen which i'm going to come back to 
Um, it's a very, very good song. My least favorite track, it's a, it's a close shot between Acting in Grounded Faith and Zero Gravitas Chamber, but I'm, but I'm gonna choose Zero Gravitas Chamber, even though the drums are astounding. I just wanna track. say as well, Zero Gravitas Chamber is a very funny song title. Oh, I thought the title was like lazy as fuck. Um, like zero gravity chamber, zero gravitas chamber. Like yeah, I get, uh, uh, I, I, I get it. I get it. But it's like you read that track and you're like, stuff. oh, I know exactly who this is about and what they're trying to say. Hilarious. Um, sure, sure, sure. I just appreciate I thought you just might appreciate the pun is all. <laughs> I, look, I appreciate any pun. Um, but that is level very of, like, evident. Um, <laughs> I appreciate every pun, but not this one. <laughs> puns, some puns are more valid than others. Uh, some puns are more equal than others. There we go. Um, I'm going to give this a seven and a half. What the fuck? <laughs> Mor- <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Morgan. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um... <laughs> Well, now my fucking phone won't load it. God damn it. Uh, my three favorite tracks... Respect. Uh, my three favorite tracks are uh, the Contagion, Invigorating Clutch, and uh, I want to say... Uh, my, my instinct is to say a belly full of salt and spleen, but for the sake of diversity, I will... <laughs> also a Siri, Joie, Joie de ne pas vivre. Um, mm-hmm. Least favorite, uh, probably Backlash, just because, even though it goes. Um, I just think it's a lyric, uh, lyrical waste of time. Yeah. Um, and for my rating, I am feeling a, a light 9 out of 10. Good, good. I love All to see right. it. All right. I love did, to see it. It's much like Reanimator in the sense that it just, its biggest appeal is that it tickled the spots in my brain that I like to have tickled. Oh, words. Morgan, the brain tickle fetishist. Yeah, look, hey, we don't, we don't kink shame. Yeah. No, hey, go for it. Did I? It's no, no, I just, no, I was just, no, I was re- reinforcing your point. If it's a fetish, then it's a fetish that all of you have because that's the so that's, true. that is literally that's, the reason we have this podcast. That's, that's how <laughs> how music works at its core. In, in yeah. fact, Tyler might be the most guilty of it because he is such an aggressive Autiker fan, and that is literally what that band is. Hey, but look, no, come on. The amount of times so where my review has basically been there is something about this that has a quality I can't explain that made me feel a way I can't talk about. <laughs> sure. August. Yeah. All right. So my uh, three favorite tracks are uh, Contagion, <laughs> Joy de Ne Pass the Very, and uh, a Balafiel of Slat and Spolani. A August. My least favorite track would be a uh, no. You having a stroke. <laughs> I, I I don't know about him, but I think I am. <laughs> Collective uh, stroke. That's a good acting album. In, acting in gouge fafafi, and my rating is 8 out of 10. Napalm Death released a record called Collective Stroke. Please. Uh, yeah. Collective they, they, Stroke. They've released one called like Collective butthole stroke something I don't know just something gross <laughs> <laughs> and the cover would look exactly like what you ever imagining it to yeah. be yeah okay uh, my three favorite tracks are uh, Fuck the Factoid Contagion and uh, Fluxing of the Muscle least favorite I will say probably Zero Gravitas Chamber and uh, I give it a six wow Okay. That's actually seven point six. That's pretty that good. That is quite respectable. Yeah. Mm, awesome. Absolutely. Okay, so that wraps up our main reviews. Now, uh, if you want to, which you should, uh, you should jump over to our uh, record club review, which uh, this week is of Swan's album, The Glowing Man. 
uh, that's a review that's going to be I've I'm, I've seen the future and it's a good review. Uh, <laughs> And or maybe you've week? seen the past and we secretly recorded okay. it before this episode just to fuck with the viewers. And next Tyler week, Tyler is in Palm Springs, and this is his second day. Tyler well, is the, the titular glowing man. No, I mean technically, I am recording from the future because it's twelve p.m. on the twenty sixth of October where I am. But um, that's true. But uh, you're, although that will be the past if you're us. watching this, so. <laughs> So anyway, on next week's main reviews, we're going to be reviewing Sufjan Stevens' new album, The Ascension, and Deftones' new album, Homies. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's not an E there. What did you do? <laughs> this is a, a technical scientific term. Yeah, to, it's, to, it's, it's part of my review already. Yeah, yeah. It, it means the unit to measure electrical resistance. It's called ohms. Yeah, anyway, oh, so we, we'll be reviewing that. And next week's Record Club review, I believe, is going to be of the Flaming Lips, Yoshimi Battles, the Pink yeah, Robots. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my so, pick. So plenty of good content coming up. Mm-hmm. Thank you for watching. Please get in the comment section and let us know what you think of the Fleet Foxes album and the Napalm Death album, if you heard them. Uh, whose side do you align with the most? Or do you think we're all horribly wrong? Uh, please let us know. They're both shit! Tennis. They're both uh, terrible anti-art hit us up on the twitter page and also coming very soon as well uh there's going to be a video up soon of uh all of us bar, all of us bar august reacting <laughs> to uh rolling stones uh list of the 500 greatest albums of all time what a fucking evening it was, that, it was in, something in we, which we questioned the point of of reviewing anything and yeah. listing music in the first it, place it, it was a record seven hour long recording it session was, it, it was a six long. hour long recording session that i'm going to try and edit down to at least under two so we'll see how that goes uh but anyway, look out for that uh and yeah thanks for watching all right did you got a all break right. tyler in here being bellator and as always folks you know how these episodes end rock over london rock on chicago <laughs> nike just do it <laughs>